The key to peace, Eritrea reopens its embassy in Ethiopia after the two countries end two decades of military stalemate. Former U.S. President Barack Obama visits Kenya, opening a school in his father's home village and urging the country's leaders to soothe ethnic tensions. And living the legacy, how the first recipient of the United Nations Mandela Prize is transforming lives in Africa. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. We begin tonight's broadcast in East Africa where Richie has reopened its embassy in Ethiopia. The reopening Monday came a week after the two countries declared an end to two decades of a military stalemate of a border war in which tens of thousands of people died. Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed handed Eritrean President Isaias Hefriwoki the keys to the embassy located in downtown Addis Ababa. The embassy opening marked the end of Hefriwoki's three-day visit to Ethiopia. Thousands of cheer, thousands cheered on Sunday as the two leaders embraced at a concert uh, celebrating a peace deal between the two former enemies. The concert highlighted the end of hostilities between the two nations who fought a two-year border war from 1998 to 2000. Prime Minister Ahmed spoke about their new relationship. Dear people of Ethiopia and Eritrea, I would like to bow down and humbly thank you because you chose compassion, not cruelty, peace, not conflict, love, not hatred, forgiveness are from skirmish, pulling each other, not pushing one another. Well, hate, discrimination and conspiracy is now over, rich in President Afrowoki told Ethiopians as he was close uh, to tears. We should not allow anyone to disturb our love and agreement. We should not allow anyone to attack our calmness and development. Ahmed was seen in Riti last week, a month after announcing Ethiopia was finally accepting the peace treaty it signed with Eritrea in 2000. The Eritreans immediately followed. Both countries have agreed to uh, reopen shattered embassies, uh, resume flights and build ports. Under the peace agreement, Ethiopia will hand over disputed border regions to Eritrea. Ahmed and Afrowoki both hope the peace deal will lead to more economic development. Eritrea was part of Ethiopia until it broke away and declared independence in 1993. Turning to the European migrant crisis, Italian Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte says five European countries have agreed to accept some of the nearly 450 migrants being transported aboard to military ships stuck off the coast of Sicily. Some 60 people, mainly women and children, rescued from a wooden, a wooden boat coming from North Africa were allowed to disembark Sunday evening in the port of Pozzallo, Sicily. Speaking in Pozzallo, a Save the Children spokesperson, Giovanni Di Benedito, urged authorities to let the other migrants disembark. We're calling for the immediate disembarkation for everyone on board, in the first place for the children and the most vulnerable people, and that they be guaranteed every form of assistance. Germany, Spain and Portugal each agreed Sunday to accept 50 of the migrants after France and Malta agreed to do the same on Saturday. But the Czech Republic rebuffed the appeal, calling the distribution, uh, the distribution plan a, a, a road to hell. The two ships, one belonging to the European Union border agency Frontex and another to the Italian border police, have been stranded in Italian waters after hardline Italian Interior Minister Matteo Silvini said the vessels should be sent to Malta, or better, Libya, from where the migrants had originally set sail. The number of migrants arriving in Italy so far this year is down about 80 percent compared to 2017. Uh, Salvini has vowed to stop all arrivals except for war refugees and a few other exceptions. Former U.S. President Barack Obama arrived in Kenya, his father's homeland, on Sunday for the first time since he left the office in 2017. Obama attended a meeting at State House Nairobi with Kenyatta Pres Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta, Deputy President William Ruto and his half-sister 
Aoma Obama, who is the chairwoman of the Kenya-based charity. He also held talks with our opposition leader, Raila Odinga, who recently agreed to work with Kenyatta after prolonged and highly contested election period in 2017. On Monday, he inaugurated Aoma Sauti, uh, Sauti Ku Foundation in Kogelo, Siaya County, and later flew to South Africa, where he will deliver 16th and Nelson Mandela's annual lecture. There were mixed reactions from the locals. We are disappointed because we were, we were expecting to see him, to, to hear to, from what he was telling, was, what he was supposed to tell us. Yeah. So we are rather disappointed. I'm urging Mr. Obama, if he can bring such, such, such projects, let him manage it himself. Don't let him give us to manage it. We have expectation. We don't just expect him to come and see us, wave to us and go back. We really want him to know our needs, what we can help us achieve in Sierra County at large. Uh, like. Uh, the, uh, we are happy of his coming. His coming may maybe make good, bring good changes to this place. Already, like his coming has made the place, the business wise, I think it has boosted the business of this place. And the youth, at least the project of uh, Dr. Aum Obama, has uplifted the place by employing youths here. So most of the youths who used to walk around. At least they are engaged inside there and they get some money. So at least there's that cash flow. Well, when speaking in Syria, Obama urged Kenya's leaders on Monday to turn their backs on the divisive ethnic politics that have frequently spilled over into violence and stamped down on the corruption that besieges East Africa's biggest economy. Among those in attendance was Samuel Atandi, the Kenyan member of parliament, for Alego Songa in Siaya County. Honorable Atandi, welcome to Africa 54. Uh, thank you, thank you, Vincent. It was uh, such a big day in Siaya. Give us a sense of uh, uh, what uh, the significance of this day was for most of the residents of uh, uh, Siaya County. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, indeed, it was uh, a very, very big event today for us. You know, the former president of the U.S. has deep roots. Uh, in this place, and so uh, he's coming here uh, is both symbolic and also uh, uh, very exciting for the locals. And uh, despite the uh, challenges that uh, were experienced, I think we, in uh, all in all, uh, uh, and a good number of us were very happy to see him and to see that he's come to join us in this, this, this event. Yeah. Now, we've listened to a few uh, of those uh, residents of CIA. They, they give uh, different views of what they thought of the visit. Uh, do you think people understood exactly what his visit was for, the purpose of his visit today, or do they have other expectations that may not be met by Mr. Obama, President Obama? Uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, the, the, he came to open the resource center to launch the resource center that has been set up by the sister, Dr. Um Obama. Uh, but uh, listening to the locals, uh, I think there's, a, first there, there's one issue uh, which basically clouded the visit. You know, the sister made a statement to the effect that uh, Kenyans or the locals were basically not doing anything and waiting for aid from uh, Barack Obama. I think that was not received very well by the locals. And two, uh, the project itself that is was being launched, you know, is uh, there's been little community participation in the in the conception and the management of the project. So most locals think that uh, they do not understand what the project is all about and how it will impact in their life. I think those are the issues that uh, touch uh, the locals. And, and lastly, that uh, the visit uh, did not uh, take into account the participation of the locals. You know, the mm -hmm. the program was very tight. And even the leader, local leadership were not allowed to, to participate in the, pro, in the program. So this was among the concerns that the locals raised and, uh, uh, on his visit. As a local member of parliament, do you see Obama's influence in that region actually contributing to people perhaps wanting to do more, to emulate him, and perhaps looking at uh, uh, him as an inspiration? Not really. I think I think as we talk, uh, there is a little influence. There's, uh, Obama's influence is, is waned. His influence has waned because 
of the fact that if he comes around the way he did, he did not have an opportunity to talk to the people so that the people can listen to him. The people initially trusted him and they had a lot of support for him. But lately, as time uh, goes, he, do, he does not get an opportunity to engage with the people and talk to them mm -hmm. and give them his thoughts and even educate them on what, what they need to do. So as we talk, I think his influence has greatly come down. And I suspect that if he comes back again in Kenya, uh, he will basically have nobody to receive him. Very quickly, he spoke to Af uh, Kenyan leaders about uh, uh, ethnicity and also corruption. You are one of the leaders there. What do you take uh, from his message? What, what is your take? Yeah, his message was very positive. You know, uh, one of the things that I must say that Kenyans appreciate of Obama is that he was able to transcend uh, in the racial uh, segregation. And we have been able as Kenyans to um, use that influence and say that uh, because he is a man from this from from this descent. He was able to rise to the, to the top position in American leadership. Mm -hmm. As Kenyan leaders, now this is the moment that we have to save and say that we can no longer use ethnicity as a tool okay. for politics, and that is something that we we'll embrace. Secondly, you know we are currently engaged in this process of building bridges, which he also spoke about, which we sincerely support. We believe this is the only way for Kenyans to move forward. And lastly. Uh, we, as Kenyans, want to fight corruption. And you also spoke about uh, fighting corruption. We want people, uh, partners to support us and support the, uh, the president and okay. our as leaders to, to ensure that uh, we fight corruption to the end. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us and sharing uh, those insights with us. Uh, that, is, uh, that was Samuel Atande, a Kenyan member of parliament from uh, Alego Songa in Siaya County. Now, this week marks the 100th anniversary of Nelson Mandela's birth. There will be commemorations around the world to recognize one of history's great leaders. In the first of a three-part series, Africa 54's Haiti Adam Fitzpatrick brings us the stories of everyday heroes who have taken Mandela's lessons into their hearts and communities. The United Nations Nelson Mandela Prize for Humanitarianism honors individuals who exemplify Mandela's legacy of reconciliation, social transformation, and political transition. Well, the first woman recipient is a Namibian ophthalmologist, Dr. Helena Ndume. She brings vision to those who had given up hope of seeing what their future in a transformed Africa looks like. Mandela accomplished a political miracle, and Dr. Ndume follows in his footsteps as Africa's miracle doctor. My name is Dr. Helena Ndume. I do have a middle name, which is traditional name, which is Ndai Povano. It means I am better off. I was born during the apartheid system where the education was different for the black people and white people, where young people were demonstrating and scared to be arrested, to be put in prison, they decide to leave the country. We left the country with three of my friends, and we managed to sneak over the border into Angola. In Angola, there were civil war bombings and killings, camps being attacked in the middle of the night while we are sleeping. You are hearing bullets flying all over your head, corpses all over the place. And mind you, I was 15 years old. We crossed into Zambia. I ended up in the refugee camps where we built hospitals, we built our own schools, we built our barracks where we were going to stay, and we started going to school there. We have mathematics, history, geography, English, and all that. It was completely eye-opening. I ended up going to university in Leipzig, Germany, to start medicine. When independence came to Namibia, I came back home. I started my internship. I was the only ophthalmologist working for the state. You have to know that back then, it is a belief that when you are old, you go blind, and 
That is God's willing. Nothing can be done about it. When I started the eye can, just 82 patients came because they say, if you go there, that young girl is going to destroy your eyes. But then the 82 that we operated on spread the message like wildfire. In the following year, we couldn't control the crowds. They came in their thousand. Everybody now wanted to be operated on. They said that independents have really come. We have doctors, and now we can see. You cannot just be in the private practice, making money, knowing very well there are thousands who are blind, and they need help. And you cannot call yourself a developed country if you have people getting blind from cataract today. No money in this world can pay for the happiness of someone who was blind. And suddenly you take off that iPad, then they say, Doctor, I can see. If I have to tell you the story that they tell you after they regain their sight, we'll spend the whole night here. Doctor, now that I can see, I'm going to work hard and plow a lot of food. Doctor, now that I can see, I'm going to see my grandchildren that I haven't seen for five, six years. Or a mother who had given birth and she never saw her baby came to see the child after cataract surgery. All of us went through difficult times during the liberation struggle in the refugee camps. And that is also what connected us together, that we must go back and help, just like we were helped. We have to have a culture of giving back to less fortunate people so that they can also be transformed, just like I was transformed. Transformation, one of Nelson Mandela's greatest visions, living today in the work of Namibian doctor Helena Ndume. Well, tomorrow we'll bring you part two of Haiti's series and introduce you. Uh, to New York dance troupe uh, bringing Mandela's life to the stage in America. Here's more on what you can expect this week as Africa 54 commemorates Nelson Mandela's 100th birthday. As the world celebrates Nelson Mandela's 100th birthday, one of his grandsons, Ndaba Mandela, speaks with Lenore Madu. He said, Daba, you are Mandela. Therefore, people will look at you as a leader. In an exclusive interview about life with his grandfather and the lessons he learned from the anti apartheid icon and Nobel Peace Prize winner. The two part series begins on Wednesday, July 18th, only on Africa 54. While well, U.S. President Donald Trump and Russian President Vladimir Putin have just finished taking questions at a wide ranging press conference following their summit meeting in Helsinki, Finland. President Trump says he spent a great deal of time addressing Russian meddling in the 2016 U.S. presidential election during what he called constructive talks with President Putin. The Trump and Putin meeting comes three days after Special Counsel Robert Mueller indicted 12 Russian intelligence officers, accusing them of meddling in the election to help Trump win the White House. Putin has denied trying to influence the vote. The two leaders met for about two hours with only interpreters and no other staff present in Finland's presidential palace. They discussed a wide range of issues from trade to security. Their meeting later expanded to include aides and other staff. Trump said his talks with Putin went well and, quote, our relationship has never been worse than it is now. However, that changed as of about four hours ago. 
Putin said the talks were held in a frank and businesslike manner and called them a success. Before the meeting started, Trump blamed the U.S. bad relationship with Russia on years of U.S. foolishness and stupidity. And now, the rigged Russian investigation witch hunt. The Russian Am uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs tweeted its response saying, we agree. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover during the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook, so check us out. Share our show with your friends. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Coming up on Africa 54, from a sports car to a cell phone operated security system, we show you the young Zambian who's re revving up scrap metal. But first, a look at Monday's headlines. Former U.S. President Barack Obama visits Kenya to promote his half-sister's charity project and meet with President Uhuru Kenyatta. In Ivory Coast, floods caused from the rise of the Bia River force at least 200 families to evacuate their home in Abuaso. Eritrean president and Ethiopian prime minister embraced at a concert following their peace agreement ending decades of conflict last week. In Morocco, thousands in Rabat protest against the jailing of leaders and activists of the northern protest movement, the al hirak al-Shabi. Finally, in Kenya, a local tanner in Kisumu is creating fish leather as a new trade to battle fish waste. While well, one Zambian youth is making great strides in innovation and technology, is also one of the nation's youngest innovators, having designed a sports car and secured a system for motor vehicles. Bioes Pondio has more. Joseph Lungu is no ordinary person. At 25 years old, he has earned several ingenuity awards. We're trying to, to prove to the world or to prove to say in Zambia, yes, we can build our own vehicle. He has a passion for fast cars, but his ability to build his own car from scrap metal is remarkable. He recently unveiled his latest automobile at a trade show in Lusaka. Lungu has also designed a safety and security device using a cell phone to monitor overloading passenger service vehicles. This is a this is a model for the vehicle. I had to come up with a system whereby when, once the vehicle is overloaded, the system automatically switches off the engine of the vehicle. At the same time, the owner will receive a text message, a video phone call to alert the owner that the vehicle is overloaded. He was the winner of the 2017 Zambia Innovation Awards. His innovations are generating a buzz, even though they are still at prototype level. I could make a project for fun, but I changed my mind. I was like, let me make something that the entire world will be able to, to use and the entire world will, be, will benefit from, or from what I'm going to make through my brains and through, uh, through my hands. Joseph works at home, where he has turned his family's backyard into a workshop. He calls Joe Tech Garage. I had to make a touch force sensor which is able to detect a force of a human being. If someone parks the vehicle and activates the system, the moment you apply a force, this system is able to trigger and send the signal to the owner's personal mobile phone. He uses his engineering skills to design all sorts of electronic products, from a personalized ATM machine to a custom sports car to his award-winning car security system. We have people that will be installing the system on your car. Mm. So once they install, they will ensure that they, yes, they configure your number in the vehicle system so that it only alerts you the owner of that particular vehicle. With his innovation, experts say this could be a game changer for a kid whose dream is to dream big. He believes with the right support it can become a reality. Paul Ndiho, VOA News, Washington. 
Well, a London-based artificial intelligence company says its AI robots, uh, robot doctors can diagnose patients just as well as a human clinician. But some general practitioners say the service can never replicate the level of care given by human doctors. Viewers Maria Madiano reports. Hi, Alexa. I want to speak to Babylon. Hello, Louise. How can I help you? Well, I've been feeling a bit dizzy recently. Using Amazon's voice-controlled assistant Alexa, the software created by Babylon Health can interpret symptoms and tell a person what might be wrong with them after a series of questions. Yeah, sometimes it feels like the room's spinning. What we're trying to do with Babylon is make healthcare accessible, affordable, put it in the hands of every human being on Earth. But the question is, how accurate is it? Can it ever, ever be as accurate as a human doctor in diagnosis. At an event in London, Babylon's founder, Dr. Ali Parsa, says the app isn't intended to replace primary care doctors, also known as general practitioners, but it can be used to lessen their work. Stanford University doctor Megan Mahoney is a believer in the technology. As well, we do face a shortage of primary care in the United States, and um, it's been difficult to recruit people into primary care because they see what it's like. They rotate through those clinics and they see that there's just 50% of our time is, is paperwork. But the program will never replicate the level of care offered by humans, says Camilla Hawthorne, even if it has some benefits. But that's all about knowledge and how they use knowledge, but it's not about clinical skills. It's not about caring for the patient. It's not about knowing the patient who's come to see you and their family and their community and the area and the work that they do, uh, which is just so much richer and so much more important to patients. At Babylon Health's London offices, Dr. Mo Bashurbat says the technology allows for an increase in accuracy. We've also seen that actually when you look at um, the conditions that a GP would see most commonly and um, actually weight the results uh, for those most commonly seen conditions, actually the accuracy of the, our AI goes up to 96%. And what that shows is that as the machine continues to learn, the, there's real opportunity for that accuracy to continue to improve. Since 2016, Babylon has partnered with the Rwandan government to deliver accessible health care via mobile phone to about 2 million registered users in rural and remote areas. Dr. Hawthorne says in those circumstances, the AI technology provides exciting opportunities. Mariama Diallo, VOA News. And that's our show for today. Have a good night. Welcome to English in a Minute. A lot of American English idioms refer to parts of the body. Get off on the wrong foot. Are Anna and Jonathan having trouble learning a dance? How did it go meeting your girlfriend's family? Well, it was uh, interesting. First, I was really late. Oh, Jonathan. Yeah, and then at dinner, I spilled my water all over her.